Um, so I'm very excited to start the a few foregut sessions. Um, many of you know that foregut surgery was how I got started in robotics and kind of learned to love it initially. So excited to invite a few great speakers. We're going to start with Dr. Prakash Gada. He's a community-based foregut surgeon out of Seattle, Washington. He's a former Dr. Lee Swanstrom fellow, so you know he knows how to operate laparoscopically. And he's going to be speaking on his experience of da Vinci foregut surgery in a community setting. Dr. Gatta. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Prakash Gatta coming from Seattle, Washington. I'm currently in an undisclosed bunker somewhere in the Seattle region, but uh, feel free to text me if you want to send me a care package or something. Um, I want to share with you my story um, about foregut surgery, uh, my origins in general surgery, I was trained by Lee Swanstrom back in 2006, 2007. And uh, my story from the robotics perspective is, I feel, a unique one. I've recently crossed a 1,000 cases. Over my years of practice, I have been able to do everything I wanted. And over the last few years, my current practice, which is around seven years ago, I have been able to evolve my practice and start new referral lines, particularly about foregut surgery. Back in 2013, when I started robotics, uh, only 13, only 11% of my practice was uh, foregut surgery. I'm thankful to say 2020 so far, it's been up close to 70%. And I want to share with you my journey as to how I felt I got here and how I feel you could do the same if this is something that interested you. My robotics journey included uh, some exposure to this in uh, general surgery. It was a broad-based and uh, pretty solid residency program. My fellowship, on the other hand, involved untraining from the robot. Now, these are very skilled surgeons who really knew what they were doing, a very forget heavy practice, and I had to learn things the laparoscopic way, primarily because robotics at that time did not answer the questions that I felt um, that it was felt were, were needed. And so they didn't solve some of those technological challenges uh, that uh, distinguish laparoscopy from robotics. 2020, of course, is, is very different. There's a few very unique intersections between what robotics can offer and what foregut asks of it to do. The one quadrant surgery, the 3D visualization, the articulation of the camera, the camera length, um, uh, the articulation of the instruments as well as the length of the instruments and the camera uh, really provide for an, for an excellent progression uh, into the area that uh, we would typically operate. If you envision the more challenging of all four procedures, such as an esophagectomy, um, the robotic trocars, the instrumentation, and where you place your instruments um, and trocars are ideally suited for this pretty complicated procedure. <laughs> there are some limitations in foregut surgery. Um, coming from my own experience, one of them was the tentativeness to do reoperative re surgeries. And it was due to, due to the lack of proprioception. I felt that um, uh, redo operations still needed me to be standing bedside, feeling kind of that tissue. The truth is, after you've gone through a few cases, maybe 40 or 50, the brain will start to rewire and understand the tissue planes and the visualization that the three-dimensional camera gives you, allowing you to see where you need to dissect and see it in a very magnified way. The combination of the improved visualization and the articulation of the instruments has never really allowed me to feel that I was doing something unsafe. And therefore, today, around 30 to 40 percent of my practice is indeed reoperative surgery. And in terms of if you were in a position to talk to your chief financial officer looking for resources to develop a foregut program or to get technology like the robots or instrumentation, one thing to keep in mind is uh, hospitals like foregut surgeries. The reason they like them is they pay well. And um, it, they pay, this is data from my own hospital. It shows that colorectal surgery actually pays a little bit less than foregut surgeries but your patients typically go home a lot sooner. So that's an efficiency piece and a productivity piece that's very important and key to the growth of any programs. Always good to keep that in mind. This is my own hospital data. I'm sure you can find that too. In terms of uh, poor placement and docking, 
Um, the SI picture is on the left um, is a little different than my current XI platform, obviously. Um, my XI trocars, all the trocars are placed uh, in one line. It allows for very simple docking, no matter what the procedure I'm doing. Now, this could be a pyloroplasty, this could be a subtotal gastrectomy or a total gastrectomy for cancer, or esophagectomy, or my more typical benign foregut diaphragmatic disease processes. Um, the uh, XI coming in from the side, as you can see here, uh, with the boom bringing the instruments over, allows for better access to the uh, oropharyngeal cavity as well as allowing for endoscopy or pla uh, placing a bougie or other instruments if you uh, felt that was needed. It's a, little, uh, a lot more difficult and more challenging with the SI platform. Here's an example of uh, uh, my mediastinal dissection on a patient with a larger hiatal hernia sac. I was always trained to remove the sac. And here my assistant is retracting and exposing the 12 o'clock area. After a couple of bites, you can see that I've entered into that mediastinal field. And I'm starting to progress and march along that anterior aspect of the esophagus and, and the hernia, hernia sac and, the, and its contents pretty rapidly. With adequate retraction and mobilization, you can see that we're starting to work around the anterior aspect pretty rapidly and, and reducing some of these contents. In terms of the posterior dissection, I think it can be a little more challenging when you're doing the posterior dissection. My key is once you are able to visualize this aspect of the procedure better, with adequate retraction, just keep in mind that those crural fibers from, from the left crural, which are actually slinging underneath the hernia sac, uh, are off at a more flatter angle. So as you're doing more dissection posteriorly and inferiorly, you'll start to see those crural fibers and you should be able to do a pretty solid circumferential dissection uh, even though you haven't switched the, uh, the viscera around to the other side. Here I finally do that, retracting the uh, stomach to the patient's right, exposing the very top of the short gastrics and allows us to complete that 360. In terms of cephalide dissection, think of this as a patient who might be needing an esophagectomy. This is actually a hiatal hernia um, patient with a large parasophageal hernia. I'm using what the technology allows me to do. I, I'll use Firefly if I want to identify the left inferior pulmonary vein, as you can see here. This landmark for me is the barrier beyond which, if I still don't have length, I need to do something more creative in order to get length back and uh, allow for three to four centimeters of uh, gastric esophagus, I mean abdominal esophagus. I did put in a short video of the short gastric takedown. You'll wonder why everybody knows how to do this. The reason I do that is a unique aspect of this particular dissection is my assistant, who's actually grasping the fundus, and now that could be you if you want to use your fourth arm for assisting yourself, very rarely will re-grasp the stomach or the omentum. Every time I take a bite, I just have the assistant pull on that tissue more, and it allows for fewer re-grasping, and it's a lot more technically faster, more efficient part of the procedure. Triangulating each time does slow you down. In terms of um, closure of the hiatal defect, my, my, my technique has evolved. Um, I used to use a horizontal mattress, Ethabon. This is the way Swanstrom taught me. And then from there, I evolved into using running V-lock. Now I use horizontal mattress running V-lock. It's a combination of both. Um, it's, a, it's a faster way for me to do things. Standard running V-lock, like a shoelace method, appears to be causing me and my patients more strictures. So here I, f I feel I'm using a permanent uh, 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 barbed suture, but the repair is actually a centimeter or so post uh, further deep into the crura, and therefore there's no direct apposition of uh, suture material with uh, the viscera. And this is a nine inch OV lock. The blue ones are absorbable, not absorbable, which is this. The absorbable ones look more green to purplish. And this is a nine inch suture. After the defect has been closed, there's plenty to run it back down again. And I do have a video, uh, which I can share with you, where there were some concerns brought up. Is this ischemic enough? Uh, are you causing ischemia? But you can prove that you're not by running some ICG 
um, to make sure that there's still flow into this tissue. In terms of a fund application, everybody knows how to do a Nissen. Doing it the Swanstrom way, which is nine to 10 stitches. This is one, one uh, such iteration. Um, as the fundus is diving underneath the GE junction, I'll take a bite at the very top of that fundus through the mesh if I'm using it, take a little bite of the um, left side of the esophagus through the crura and bring it back down. And this acts as a fulcrum stitch for me to make sure that the, uh, the, uh, the wrap does not slip back out through there. I also do stitches within the wrap uh, as opposed to just the three anterior uh, fundoplication stitches, these anastomotic stitches, or the, uh, the wrap from slipping up or down. In terms of reoperative surgery, uh, I use phasix mesh when I'm using, uh, when I do use mesh for parasophagia hernia repairs. You can see the viscera coming off that, uh, um, the, the separate film side of that mesh fairly easily. This is a patient with uh, 26 months out. Um, and I can see uh, those planes pretty easily. Actually, I'm using my fourth arm to retract the liver, but I'm able to find those, uh, the inside of that hernia sac with the sutures that I placed. Those I feel are my hardest reduce because I put in a lot more stitches than other people might. Hopefully I don't have to do a lot of these. Here's another example of reoperative surgery where you're actually taking down the old fund application. I'm verifying the uh, vas uh, that I haven't devascularized or taken down the left gastric artery in the process, identifying those vessels using technology and using my vessel sealer, which is a fairly blunt dissector, fairly safe dissector. I'm able to find out where the old anastomosis is, where those old stitches are without making holes in the stomach. In this particular case, I converted a uh, Nissen into a toupee. This is a unique uh, post-op hernia from a patient I did an esophagectomy on around nine months ago. That's actually the gastric conduit going way up into the chest where it's supposed to be. This is a giant defect the patient presented to the ER with small bowel in his mediastinum. I'm verifying that I haven't devascularized the conduit, but after I've reduced the contents, I was basically too nervous to do a posterior repair, which is our standard. So I did an anterior repair, ran the cura from where I felt I could approximate it anterior to uh, the conduit and brought it back down. And you can see after a couple of uh, bites, you'll reapproximate fairly well. And remember, there's a few other things you can do if you feel the tissue is starting to tear, the muscle is, um, which is to drop the pneumo. I don't really do things like relaxing incisions. I'm not fancy enough for things like that. I've never really felt in my last 12 years that that was necessary. I'm verifying that the conduit is still alive and I haven't strangulated it. I'm also verifying that I've reduced all the contents from within that sac. I continue to use a suture until I have a more comprehensive repair using a few extra bites, making sure that the crew appears to be vascular and I haven't devascularized it using ICG. And then I actually do put mesh in an upside down position. This is after the closure is done. That spot on the screen is bothering me too. So I got a nice supple conduit. The mesh is now upside down and I, I'm pretty happy with that closure. This patient went home the same day, by the way. This is post-esophagectomy, a 75-year-old gentleman using the same trocars. Now, there's a few things I've eliminated in my evolution as a foregut surgeon. I don't do routine endoscopies. Um, I, I may use them more frequently on redo operations or more difficult cases. I don't do routine esophagrams. I will do them on redos and um, achalasia patients. Um, I don't put Foley's in. I don't put an NG tube in. The patient is uh, placed supine with uh, something to prevent them from slipping. I'll use those uh, pink, pink mats, etc. I don't use a, a laparoscopic liver retractor as I felt that the uh, um, robotic um, instrument gives me that advantage for redo cases, especially. Um, but that's not, that may not be what something uh, that may not be something that works for you because I am I'm pampered because I have a PA or nurse practitioner always with me and they're able to anticipate my moves and make
make me look efficient. Most important takeaway point here is I never use instrument. I never exchange instruments. I have a bipolar grasper as my left hand. I have a vessel sealer as my right hand, and um, a larger instrument could be a tip up as my liver retractor. Of course, you're free to use everything you need. Uh, for achalasia surgery, I will use all four robotic arms to give me that triangulation and the myotomy. My back table is fairly simple. I don't use many instruments, therefore it's a lot easier to do these turnovers. I fast track my patients. Uh, if we do put a Foley in, we'd try to get it out at the end of the case. I ambulate them early, most of them on the same day. In terms of my operating time, my uh, this is five year data. Uh, my own data shows that I'm a, I'm a better surgeon than where I was five, six years ago. And it's not just for gut surgery. This is for inguinal hernias and, uh, and for cholecystectomies. My, uh, my efficiency is across the board and it may or may not have to do with the robot, but I think it does. In terms of length of stay, I've been able to shave off at least a day and a half to two days in length of stay for my hiatal hernia cases. And that goes with redos as well. You can see here in my 2020 data, my median cut to close time is under 80 minutes for a redo operation. And I do a fair number of these. Same goes with my length of stay on my redo patients as well. So how do I quantify this? Um, if, you were quanti if you were to convert this into dollars, this is a conservative number. And if you were to use $21 per minute of anesthesia time and how much more efficient you are as a surgeon, um, let's say I operate for 60 minutes less to do the same operations I did six, six to seven years ago, as well as my mean length of stay is at least a day or two days less, that translates into real money. My evolution has been from going from benign procedures to malignant disease, from simple nuisance to large parasophageal hernias. I do a fair number of redo patients, not just redo foregut, they could be redo other things from a prior laparotomy, etc. But I feel that as my feedback has been good, as I'm starting to enjoy and do more and more foregut, my greatest referral source has been not only the other specialists, but partners as well. In terms of the integrated ecosystem, this is something that's very unique to the robot robotic system that we use. Um, I have, there's no doubt that I've been able to lower my cost by being more efficient. My experience is a Provider as a surgeon has been far more superior than my, than my laparoscopic days. Um, my patient experience has improved. My patients going home the same day and their return to work is far faster. And my better outcomes um, uh, is something that I'm very proud of. When patients are returning to work. Uh, my follow-up in general has uh, shown a very low patient rate. Now, I wanted to sidetrack just slightly. And in terms of where we think robotics and the current technology is gonna take us. One thing that has really changed in the last six months to a year is the aspect of artificial intelligence and surgery. Now, if you think of robotics as a platform, uh, it, it, it's like the Tesla, which is driving, your, driving you back and from work. Artificial intelligence is a way to compute data that it collects every day and to be able to translate that into better outcomes. With the surgeon always piloting this plane, um, the technology and the analysis that it may be able to provide you on a real-time basis can and will make you a better surgeon. And I think it's not something that's going to that's gonna diminish my role as a surgeon, but it will enhance my role. And I really think that allowing for robotics to teach you or to teach others something that you do well will really enhance and um, uh, further the evolution of surgery to our descendants. Um, and if you look in this one publication, if there was one complication that we could have avoided, that translates into thousands and thousands of dollars per patient. So I'm saying we use artificial intelligence and technology and robotics as a way to teach others to make us better surgeons, better physicians, better stewards of what we've been given as well as reducing complications and providing for better outcomes. There is no way we would not consider this serious. My total practice pathway started the way most general surgeons do, which is to start uh, doing inguinal hernias, gallbladders, or racking up some of these cases, essentially converting my daily practice into a robotic practice. And it is through that that I've been able to accomplish and reach my passion, which is foregut surgery. I don't do bariatrics. And I work in Seattle, 
when I first started here, there was three well, very well-established FORGA practices that already existed. And it was hard to change those referral patterns, but my numbers uh, rival those of the largest Seattle hospital systems. My mission statement is pretty simple. I want to open the door to democratization of surgery, which means allowing for everyone else to be able to do what I do and for me to learn from them. Similar platforms and technology would allow that to happen. Robotics will be the standard of care, and I want to be one of the standard bearers to relay this message because I believe it's true. I want to utilize interoperatively collected data as a predictor of better outcomes and to make that uh, a way to learn. I want to empower the protection of my practice, my patients, by being involved in the evolution of surgery and technology. Um, I really hope that um, you guys have enjoyed this talk. I've really enjoyed the opportunity to give this talk. I hope we can all stay safe in this trying time. We will all get together and we will all meet again soon. Thank you so much. Awesome talk, Prakash. I really enjoy watching your videos. I've actually already watched that presentation several times because I thought it was so uh, useful. A lot of great tips in there. I love that you pointed out the foregut culture specifically. Even of those that have adopted robotics, meaning those uh, foregut surgeons, the most common approach is often to argue the use and the benefit in complex and revisional cases only. So first, my question is, what are your thoughts on this? And second, if a surgeon wants to tackle robotic foreguts, is there a general progression that you recommend? That's a great question. So, so thank you for your kind comments. Now, I, I want to answer the last part of your question. If you look at that one of the slides where there's like an ecosystem or a tree, I think my foundation in robotics was a lot of bread and butter, general surgery, gallbladders, hernias, ventral hernias. Um, and, and I worked that skill towards my passion of foregut. Uh, and, and so I think it's a good, it's good to have a good foundation because it, it does a few things. It helps you build the teams, helps you understand the turnover. It reduces some of that anxiety that you or your team might have that, hey, it's a robotic day. I'm gonna have two or three cases. It's actually gonna go well because I have a motivated team that's passionate about the technology and sees the vision and actually wants to be there. It's not the ortho team that's being forced to do it. So I think that was part of the program building that helped me because foregut can be complicated and you can do a lot of new cases and um, it can be long days and I needed, I needed my team members to be with me. In terms of my foregut progression, um, I, I, I'm a non-believer in using it only for the tough cases because the non-tough cases, the standard Nissens, even if it's a large high of hernia, uh, and then you do a Nissen in on the non-redo cases was where I started. The first 20, 30, 40, 50 cases allowed me to really get comfortable up in the mediastinum. And I never used to use it for redo cases just because I felt that perfect reception was lost. But as your brain rewires and it understands those tissue planes and understands what the, uh, what the, the instrumentation and the dissection can do, is when I started getting really comfortable with the redo operations and I felt that I was doing a better repair, dissecting more, getting more length, all of those metrics that uh, we feel we need to have a good second or third operation. Uh, and I felt the, the robotic platform allowed me to do a better job and a more efficient job doing that. Totally agree. So next kind of a comment, one foregut, I think you'd probably agree is a competitive field. So the, the referrals are hard to earn as GI docs are often loyal, which is good once you've earned them, but it's kind of hard to build that base. Second, the surgeons who have seen the light know that foregut is really satisfying and I think, frankly, fun. Um, and so they often don't want to share those cases. I remember when I was interviewing at a fellowship, for example, that a lot of the uh, places that I interviewed at, the senior surgeons basically hoarded all the foregut and told me flat out, we're not going to give you any of it, um, and not to the junior people anyway. So you have been incredibly successful in building a primarily foregut practice. So what's the secret? That's what I want to know. How do we emulate that? And do you think offering a robotic approach is something that has contributed to that? So great questions. Thank you. I think I've, I've been, so, you know, how are you successful? A lot of it has to do with luck. There's a lot of people who are more skilled than me and harder workers than me who are doing or able to do less. And so I think certainly as with many things in life, there's a lot of luck to it. I do think I have supportive partners, that was good, but my partners are supportive to the point where 
they didn't want to do four gun. Okay, so that was a huge advantage for me. They didn't enjoy doing it. And I'm like, who doesn't enjoy doing four gun? Probably because they had the, the tough cases and they had sure. alternatives that they could refer the tougher cases out to uh, further north from my system. So I, the way it worked for me was um, geographically, Seattle was sort of a more of a north south corridor, I 5, uh, and you know, as opposed to Dallas or Phoenix, which is more of a pancake. Um, so the patients don't want to travel. So I was able to assess that there was a need in, in the local community for some of these complex cases. Biggest referral, of course, is GI and maybe pulmonology. To build their trust, I had to do a lot of standard general surgery, get referrals from my partners before I was able to establish uh, myself as a safe surgeon with good outcomes, and then go to them and uh, give them didactic talks. Uh, for example, our GI group has a big uh, nurse practitioner, PA, uh, primary care provider base. Uh, go to the primary care uh, as well, give them talks about how the disease process is. The, the average GI doc finds the fundoplication as they'll try to talk patients out of that, obviously, because they see the complications, they don't always see the benefit. Uh, but to go to them, present data, because a surgeon hadn't talked to them in 10 years or 15 years, to go to them and give them some time a day Building that practice and the trust with your partners and the referral docs really helped me. Um, and then eventually the patients understood the options existed locally for them not to have to drive to Seattle or for uh, downtown Seattle and to pay for parking, et cetera, and that we were providing great quality care. The second part of your question was, is robotics helping me? No question, robotics is my catalyst because it allows me to be more efficient as a team and allows me to do better operations. So I do four robotic cases, four gut cases, which are highly compensated, as you know, like an average 43282, which is a parasophageal hernia with mesh, highest billing code for a hernia repair, uh, high hernia repair is like three gallbladders or four gallbladders. So you do th three or four of those in a day, that's a, that's a lot of general surgery, and you can be done by five. Uh, that's three turnovers or four turnovers, depending on how many cases you do. Um, so building, building trust, um, building efficiency, and building a team. And, and we build many teams what's going on. is what, what's helped. All really great tips. Thank you so much for joining us today.